Welcome, today we would be talking on one of the major topics that is ecosystem, a very very important topic. Most of the exams have usually one to two questions from this topic. Now before we start with what is ecosystem, let's have a difference between the three terms ecosystem, ecology and environment. So when I say ecology, it's the study of the surrounding or the study of the various ecosystems. When I talk about ecosystem, it's important to understand ecosystem talks about interrelationships between organism and environment and environment and environment and organism and organism. So I can explain it in three ways, organism and organism organism with their environment and environment with its environment. So those are the three kind of interactions we talk about under ecosystem and all these three are governed by the biotic and the abiotic components that are present. Now this ecosystem is both a structural and a functional unit. It is an open system. What does an open system mean? Open system means there is exchange of energy and matter that takes place. So exchange of energy and matter takes place in a ecosystem. Now when we are talking about ecology, we focus on three types of ecology. You have population ecology, community ecology and ecosystem ecology. So population ecology talks about the study between the population of the same species. Under community ecology, we talk about interactions between different species and under ecosystem ecology, we talk about a much uh, broader outlook where we consider the whole ecosystem. And finally, the last term that we said was environment. So environment includes the living and the non-living features that are present. Coming on to the concept of homeostasis, before that let's work on the types of ecosystem. So when I say types of ecosystem, ecosystem can be terrestrial that is on land, it can be aquatic that is on water or in water. So those are the two basic classifications for the ecosystem. The second classification that we work around ecosystem is a natural ecosystem or a anthropogenic ecosystem or man-made ecosystem. So when I say natural, it would be like a forest. When I say artificial or anthropogenic or man-made ecosystem, it would be an aquarium, a small garden and so on. What are the various types of ecosystems based on the size? So based on the size, I can say you have a nano ecosystem. Nano means very small. Then you have micro, bigger than that, meso further bigger, mega further bigger, and then you have lastly the global e ecosystem. So when I say global, I talk about biosphere. And biosphere is the interaction of atmosphere, hydrosphere and lithosphere. So that's what we talk under biosphere. Then you have mega, uh, mega ecosystem like ocean, meso ecosystem like forest, micro ecosystem like a small pond and nano ecosystem which is further smaller like a small aquarium. So those are the various types of ecosystem that could be classified, the three various classifications that we have talked about. The next is homeostasis. Homeostasis or biological equilibrium talks about maintaining the balance and this balance is not static. It's it fluctuates, but that fluctuation usually is within the limits. So there is fluctuation, but it's usually within the limits. And this homeostasis is controlled by four factors. Now, sometimes there could be a direct question, which of the following is not a factor or which of the following is a factor that affects homeostasis or biological equilibrium. So carrying capacity, definitely the amount of individuals that a place can sustain is the carrying capacity recycling of the waste material, self-regulation in the system and feedback system. So those are some of the major uh, concepts or controls that we talk uh, under the homeostasis. Coming on to the components, as we said, components of the ecosystem can be broadly classified into biotic and abiotic. Biotic from the word itself means it's related to biology or living beings. Abiotic on the other hand talks about non-living uh, non factors. So when I say biotic factors, I can further classify it into three types. That's the producers, consumers and de uh, decomposers. 
Let's understand these one by one. Before that, I will have a simple food chain for you to help understand this topic further. So let's say I have some green plants. There are grasshoppers coming and they feed on these green plants. Now, these grasshoppers are happy in their environment. Suddenly, a bird flies in and eats up those grasshoppers. Then, that bird is moving around and suddenly a snake comes in and eats that bird. So that is a kind of food chain that we try to explain and <clears throat> the various components of the biotic factors would be understood with the help of the simple food chain again. So let's say producers. So producers are autotrophs. That means they have the capability to produce their own food in presence of sunlight. So this is done mainly by the green plants which have a green pigment known as chlorophyll and in presence of light they do the process of photosynthesis which converts the radiant energy that's the energy from the sunlight into the chemical form and therefore these producers are also known as transducers. The next is consumers. Consumers are those which rely on the producers for food and therefore they are known as heterotrophs. Now these consumers could further be classified under two different categories. We have the herbivores which feed on the plants like cow, goat. Then you have the carnivores. Carnivores are those which feed on the other animals so it could be the other herbivorous animals and then you have another classification that's omnivorous which consume both plants and animals like beer so so far we are considering herbivores and carnivores under carnivores i can say there could be three different levels primary carnivores secondary carnivores and tertiary carnivores are the top carnivores top carnivores a good example would be lion Primary carnivores would be those which would feed on the herbivores. Secondary carnivores would be those which would feed on the primary carnivores. And tertiary carnivores would be those which would feed on the secondary carnivores. So when we took the example of plant, we have plant here. Okay, so plant is the producer. Now who fed on the plant was a grasshopper. Who fed on the grasshopper was a bird. So bird becomes a primary carnivore. Feeding on the bird you had snake. So a snake becomes a secondary carnivore. So that's how we try to understand the various primary, secondary and tertiary carnivores within it. And then you have decomposers. These decomposers are also known as reducers because they break down the uh, matter or decay the matter further. Now, when we talk about decomposers, we would be talking about decomposers further later in this section. But there is one very important concept that we need to clear about decomposers. So we'll discuss it right now. When I classify decomposers, I can classify decomposers simply into two. That's detrivores and fungi. So make sure detrivores and decomposers are not the same. Decomposers break down or decay. They help in the process of decay of the material. Now fungi, bacteria are all classic examples of decomposers which release enzymes to break down or decompose the existing material and therefore they are also known as reducers. However, detrivores is a further subclassification of the decomposers and these detrivores feed on detrius. This detrius is the dead decaying material. So it's a kind of dead decaying material that's present. And what's the key aspect here is most of the worms, millipedes, slugs are example of detrivores. So a good example would be earthworm which is also known as farmer's friend. Now what does earthworm eat? eat on. Earthworm eats on the dead leaves. So you have other organisms that are, all these are basically heterotrophs and you have other organisms who are further eating on different things or different animals as well. So all these detrivores, the key idea is 
द डीकम्पोजर ओनली डिकेज दैम बट डेट्रीवोर्स फर्दर ब्रेक डाउन ब्रेक दैम डाउन एंड दे हेल्प इन द प्रोसेस ऑफ रिसाइकलिंग सो दैट्स द की आइडिया फॉर द डेट्रीवोर्स सो डेट्रीवोर्स स्पीड ऑफ द प्रोसेस ऑफ डिके दे फीड ऑन ऑल द डेड मटीरियल दैट्स देयर and finally help in the process of recycling now detrivores and scavengers are further two separate terms so when we talk about detrivores or decomposers we use a common term which is known as saprophytes or saprotrophs so saprophytes or saprotrophs are basically those which have the capability of decaying the material now when we talk about scavengers a classic example of scavenger would be vulture which feeds on dead organisms so when we say scavenger they feed on the dead mass so they consume a large quantity of organic matter then after the consumption what is being left is being consumed by detrivores so the difference between scavengers and detrivores again is very very important so those are some of the key aspects that we have discussed so far then you have so the, these were the biotic components coming on to the abiotic components under abiotic components you have definitely the impact of temperature the light that is present in presence of light you have the process of photosynthesis that takes place the level of wind that is blowing into the atmosphere the humidity so with the humid conditions you have epiphytes that grow into the region then the amount of rainfall that is present in the region presence of water so if there is lack of water you have xerophytic vegetation as seen in the deserts however in the areas rich in water you have hydrophytes or in the water bodies or the shallow waters you have hydrophytes that are present then you have the impact of the background <clears throat> some of the orga organisms adapt themselves to the uh, environment for example let's say uh, frog so it's green in color based on its surrounding but some have the capability to even change colors for example chameleon which can change its color based on the background then you have the ph of the soil ph of the soil is a very important indicator so ph ranges from 0 to 14 7 being the neutral so usually we say if the ph is high or it's acidic detrivores cannot survive and they would die and therefore detrivores grow in a soil which is rich in uh, or rich basically is alkaline or rich in the basic properties so therefore you have all the calcareous shells all the detrivores that grow well in a basic ph however eugelina flagellates all these are present in the acidic surrounding then you have the relief the mountain features the region of the mountain where you have the windward side and the leeward side of the mountains that we have discussed in our other classes in sciences so the idea is where you have the uh, rainfall falling in Uh, the region where the cloud is being hit and you have the rainfall falling in and the other side of the mountain which you do not which does not have ample of rainfall so there would be difference in the flora and the fauna found in the two areas so biotic fa abiotic factors definitely affect the presence of the ecosystem or the flora and the fauna in a region now if you look around in your day to day examples you might have seen each and everything surrounding to you but you never have thought about it as to why we are studying those or why we why these are present or what's their importance so that's what we are trying to cover in this lecture now when we talk about ecosystem there is one very important property which is known as reductionism so when i say reductionism it means simplifying the complexities that exist in the ecosystem so let's say there are n number of different species that are present now my idea is to bring all those n number of different species of plants together and classify them as producers or autotrophs so all green plants i would classify as producers or autotrophs and what i am trying to do is i am trying to reduce the complexities in the study and therefore study of ecosystem or ecology is also considered under the area of reductionism and therefore you you must remember this term which is very very important in ecosystem the next is the structure so under the structure you have the various trophic levels 
which we would be continuing in our next class on ecosystems. Stratification is the vertical layering. So you have small grasses, shrubs, herbs and bigger trees. So those type of canopies clearly visible in the tropical and the temperate areas. We'll talk about this further as we move further in our other lectures. Then you have species composition. So it helps us to identify and number the amount or the number of the flora and the fauna, the plants and the animals. Standing crop and standing state, very very important terminology to understand the difference between them is very simple. So state is something which is there or it's present, so it's non-living. Crop is living and therefore when we say standing crop, we talk about living biomass. When we talk about standing state, we talk about the inorganic nutrients or the non-living biomass. So that's the key difference between the two terms. Simple to remember with a very simple idea, you can easily remember those. Now when we talk about ecosystem functions, there are four primary functions, two of which we will be dealing in the next two lectures. So energy flow along with the food chain, food pyramid, the Lindman's law we would be covering in a separate lecture. The next is nutrient cycling. So under nutrient cycling, you have the carbon cycle, the water cycle, nitrogen cycle, sulfur cycle. So all those would be dealt in a separate lecture. Today, our focus would be working around productivity and decomposition. Very simple difference to understand between the two. When I say productivity, I am trying to trap in energy. So I am trying to bring in energy and therefore it's a kind of process which requires synthesis. So different molecules are joined together and you have synthesis that takes place under productivity. However, when I talk about decomposition, what happens is the existing molecule breaks off and when it is breaking off, there is release of energy that takes place and this breakdown is also known as catabolism. So joining of the material together is known as anabolism, which is seen in the productivity. Under decomposition, we see catabolism. So those two terms are again important to remember. Now next thing we are trying to understand is the types of productivity. Under the types of, let's first talk about what is productivity. So we say it's the rate of synthesis of energy, which is contained in a biomass uh, at each trophic level or any of the trophic levels per unit area in a unit time. So there are two ways to measure it based on the weight and based on the energy. So sometimes there could be a direct question on what is the unit for measuring a productivity based on weight or based on energy. So you have grams per meter cube per year or kilocalories per meter cube per year. So those are the standard uh, measurement units. However, we talk about primary productivity and secondary productivity. Primary productivity is the energy accumulation by the green plants. Under secondary productivity, we talk about the rate of resynthesis by the consumers. And when we talk about net and gross primary productivity, it's again important. So gross primary productivity is the total weight of the organic substance that is present. And if I remove the rate of respiration from this total rate, I get the net primary productivity. And this net primary productivity is simply the weight of organic matter that is stored in the organism. So that's the net primary productivity. Now the rate of respiration loss varies for different organisms. It's usually 20% for autotrophs, 30% for herbivores and 60% for carnivores. Now we say the highest productivity is seen in the tropical rainforest areas and the minimum in the desert or the arctic areas. And here we have a decreasing order of productivity. As we can say, it's highest for the tropical, followed by the temperate and then the scrub or the desert and the uh, 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 arctic areas. So this order is sometimes a direct question again for your MCQs. So make sure you are well versed with it. The next is the factors that affect productivity. So just to simplify this further, if you look onto a globe, you have the equator. The region surrounding the equator would be the tropic and next to it would be the temperate areas. So now you can clearly understand that the region which is nearby to the equator is the tropical area and that tropical area has higher productivity as compared to the temperate areas because of the uh, 
good quantity of sunlight that is present in this region. Now, what are the factors that affect productivity? As I said, sunlight, so solar radiation is one of the key factors that is present here. Then temperature definitely affects the productivity. So if the temperature is optimum, productivity would be high. If the temperature is too high as in the case of deserts or too low as in the case of Arctic areas, the productivity won't be good. Good amount of moisture nutrients are present for good efficiency. Decomposition we already talked about. So under decomposition again we say decomposition above the ground and below the ground. Above the ground is basically in the form of dead leaves and humus that ultimately forms in by the process of humification. So above the ground you have litter. A very good difference between litter and detritus is detritus includes both plant and animal uh, matter. However, uh, litter is only plant driven. So it's only obtained from plants. So what is obtained from plant is known as litter. What is obtained from both plants and animals is known as detritus. So the two differences, the differences between the two is very important. Then below the ground you definitely have dead roots, underground dead animals and so on. Now the process of decomposition, first of all there is fragmentation that occurs as is seen by earthworm, what we have already talked about, it's a catabolic process and then you have leaching where the soluble materials or soluble substances are leached out. So there are two processes involved. First is humification by the process of which you have humus formation. So within the soil, the topmost layer which we say is dark colored and most fertile is considered as humus and it's organically rich in lignin and cellulose. So in what contents it is rich is again an important question. Then under the inorganic uh, nutrients, you have the process of mineralization that takes place. And this mineralization can be as non-mineral and mineral. So non-mineral includes water, carbon dioxide and when we say mineral, it's calcium, magnesium, potassium and so on. So what are the factors that affect the decomposition? Definitely temperature, moisture, if, it's, if there is too much moisture, oxygen exchange would not be possible and therefore decomposition would be retarded due to the process of anaerobic activities that is lack of oxygen. Then pH we have already talked about how it affects the detrivores before and then what is required is the regular supply of oxygen that is the aerobiosis that is required. So those are some of the key components that we have discussed in today's lecture. In the next lecture we will be continuing with energy flow, the trophic levels and the energy flow that is the food chain, food pyramid, food web, the various types of pyramids and then we will be following this lecture with the energy flow and the Lindman's 10% law which are very very important to understand. Stay tuned, do subscribe if you have any doubt comments leave those in the dialog box below have a very good day ahead